Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome for those who are new in the room. Uh, we had a very nice session about OSG. Sadly, you missed it. You can always watch it back afterwards. Um, but uh, we're now having our next session, and that's from um, Chris and from Kevin, who are working with, uh, with Facebook. And they're not, uh, yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna show us and tell us more about uh, an automated ingestion framework for OpenStreetMap data that allows us to selectively update parts of the map. Um, so I myself am very curious what it is about, so I give them a warm applause to welcome, and let's give it a go. All right, hey everybody. I'm Christopher and Kevin, as we've gone. And uh, today we're going to cover some of our adventures in using OSM data at Facebook. Um, so, maintaining quality in a database with millions and millions of features is difficult. And OSM is a giant database with millions and millions of features and thousands of mappers. And uh, ensuring data quality here um, kind of has been a challenge throughout the history of the project. Um, uh, at Facebook, we've been thinking about how to maintain quality and also how to improve it, uh, in part by ensuring that only good stuff is getting onto the map as best we can. Uh, so today we'll talk about the tooling and the AI that we're using to do that. Okay, so it may or may not surprise you to learn that Facebook has maps. Uh, there are many in various use cases. We have maps for places like search and events and travel. Uh, there are humanitarian causes. There are job listings pages. Um, you might even find it useful to send a friend your location if you're trying to meet up, say, at a conference uh, in a foreign place. And so what we found is that high-quality maps make for better user experiences. Uh, in fact, we've got more than 140 different use cases across the entire Facebook library of apps. Um, for now, what we're doing is we're using OSM as our base map globally for, for all the maps that we have. Um, but OSM data is only one part of what makes up a map on Facebook. The teams will layer on additional data uh, on top of it for the various products. So you might be visiting a places page and all the pin locations are actually Facebook data and not OSM data. So they're from a totally different data set. Um, or you may find that you're you know, visiting, um, seeing like a job listing and, and having the location data there or looking up restaurant recommendations from your friends and having them show up on a map in your feed. Um, and as a user-facing product, of course, we're very interested in keeping an excellent user experience. And to do that, um, that means keeping kind of like a high quality of qual a high level of quality data. And the world's a very big place, and so there are lots of things that can go wrong in lots of places. Uh, and we approach the problem in two different ways: reactively and proactively. Um, first, talking reactively, uh, one of the ways we do this is through map reports on our product. Uh, on any map surface on Facebook, you'll have the ability to report a maps issue, and um, a user can, can bring that to our attention. Like, this town name is wrong, or this road looks incorrect, or, you know, my business isn't located here, or, um, you know, this isn't the location I searched for, or something like that. Uh, and we get about 600 of these reports each day, and we have a team that goes through and looks at, them, looks at each and every one. Since we started using OpenStreetMap on our maps, there have been over 192,000 um, user reports have been made that we've, we've gone through each one and taken a look at it. Generally, the reports fall into these two buckets. We've got ones that are relevant to Facebook data to get fixed, and then also ones that get fixed in the community uh, on OSM that we fix with the community. Here's um, an example of a fix on Facebook data. So although the map is correct, the base map has the right uh, village name from OpenStreetMap, what you're seeing is that fa the Facebook kind of surrounding has the wrong uh, places information from Facebook's data set. And so in this case, we talk to the appropriate team at Facebook and we, we get that fixed. Um, so these are reports that we get that fixed. Um, the other case is kind of more typical, and this is where we'd find something going on on OpenStreetMap. Um, and we try and go in and fix it. So today we've had more, al almost 400 uh, issues have been directly fixed by our team in OpenStreetMap, um, directly from these issues we've reported. And beyond that, there are also some broader scale issues like uh, generic names, uh, things like name is equals yes, or name equals road, or name equals a building. Um, and we found thousands of these uh, all over the map. Um, and so we set up tasks to fix these. Um, and our partner in Indonesia, Hot Indonesia, um, has fixed more than uh, 15,000 of these themselves uh, using Map Roulette. 
Beyond that, we've also made public tasks um, in MapRoulette, uh, public challenges where we fixed a, we've had over 30,000 features fixed um, there. But there are, there are plenty more to go, so um, those are up and available. Um, if you've been on MapRoulette in the last, I don't know, six to eight months or so, you might have seen some of these uh, incorrect name challenges that we've set up. Um, there are lots of these. Uh, this is you know, an example of one of the ones that we've got up. Um, let's see, and, and here's kind of some statistics about issues that we fixed uh, in MapRoulette. There's kind of three buckets of information that we've got going on here uh, for different types of, of fixes and then what, kind of where they were fixed, whether it was uh, a Facebook fix or a community fix. And um, we found too that you know, we'll go and work on these kind of publicly uh, with our accounts and our mapping teams and, and fix them there. Um, and we've also found that when the information's out there, uh, the community will definitely engage with, with what's there and, and you know, is interested in making fixes um, as well. And also, uh, let's see, yeah. So I guess, can you read? No, probably not. The, um, the, the like leftmost bucket there for scale, the green bar is 6,000 fixes. So those are community fixes um, that we've had done through MapRoulette, um, and that's over 6,000. So there's been quite, quite a few issues here. Um, okay, so next I'd like to talk a bit about some of the integration that we've got with ID in terms of kind of fixing data, bad data before it gets into the map. Um, and, and so we love ID. We've been using it as our main mapping tool for our AI-assisted projects for years. Um, and when we were doing this a while back, one of our main uh, gaps was uh, having a better validation system. Uh, so using Jotham as inspiration for this, we've kind of been adding validations into ID to catch common issues um, like a geometry check um, for I don't know, your resident, your road, a road's crossing another road, this road's too short, um, there's a, a road that's not connected to the road network here, um, you know, all sorts of these. And uh, we shared out our original version, which was on the left, um, kind of homegrown with Brian and Quincy, and they, they took it and made it way better for, uh, for official ID. And that's the beautiful version that we've got here on the right. Uh, so that's now in mainline ID, and it's got a few extra features, like you can turn on and off, you know, are you searching just my edits, or are you looking for um, validation on everything that's in the, the viewable area in ID. Um, so they've done a really nice job with that feature. And these checks make it really simple, uh, really easy to catch simple errors um, and, and kind of get that fixed up even before it enters the, the database. Okay, so moving on to the tasking manager. You know, we also uh, work in HOTS tasking manager um, with our, our, our internal processes. Uh, in many parts of the world, remain unmapped, uh, and it's especially true in developing countries. And, you know, um, mapping is, is kind of a complicated task even for experienced mappers, uh, and, and so many of the people in the public team are new. And so one thing we've done is we've brought in uh, we brought in Rapid here to make it available, um, so you can just go into that, and I'll show you in a minute how that catches some, valid, some, some data issues and makes it really good to draw quality roads up front. Um, yeah. But before I do that, I want to also talk about this. Um, so here's a case where you know, it's not about just the tooling or the AI that we've got there, but it's also about the ground truthing. And so we've been working with local teams to, to spot whether what we're showing is kind of, or, or what we're seeing in the satellite is actually what we think it is. So here's a case where, um, you know, from the satellite imagery, we've got two bridges. They look like bridges. You know, we wouldn't know quite how to mark them up properly, but when you actually get on the ground, they're very different, uh, what you see there. You know, one's suitable for walking across, and the other one is you can drive a car over. Um, so it's, you know, kind of this local knowledge you can only get on the ground. Um, and we found that the, the AI that we have does help here. Like, if we can spend less time digitizing uh, and doing that, it kind of opens up more of the, you know, the time just to uh, be able to get out uh, on the ground and, and, and do some ground truthing. Um, and also we provide this information back to the community so that if you're looking, if you're within the community and looking at satellite imagery, you know, it might provide you some extra perspective on, on how this is, you know, how you might be thinking about these things um, from the sky. All right. So over the past year and a half, um, 
with AI plus the local mapping team, uh, we've completed more than 99% of the roads in Indonesia. And so here's a short animation. It kind of shows day by day how our mapping has gone um, there. And yeah, so you can see the distance is ticking up and the feature is ticking up. So yeah, about 18 months of work from last May up until just a few weeks ago is what's present in this visualization. Um, we're in 2019. Yeah, yeah so over four, 450,000 kilometers uh, mapped and it's actually over a million features uh, that, that we've mapped uh, going in there. Okay, so it's a lot. There's a lot to do. There's a lot of work. Um, there's limited time, and everyone, <laughs> is, their own resources are limited. And so this is why we kind of started to look at ways in which we can uh, speed up the process uh, to improve the data coverage and also to fill in the missing gaps with AI. So I'm going to talk now about what we call our map with AI efforts, um, where we get into our work there. And starting about 15 years ago, uh, when satellite images kind of came online and began to be used for mapping, there was kind of a wide debate about privacy, precision, um, and how we ought to use these things. But today, it's very different. You know, now we're using these regularly. They have known limitations. You know, alignment is one of these notable limitations. Um, but we kind of know how to work with it. It's a known quantity. Uh, it feels like computer-assisted mapping is going through the same kind of debate stage right now that we were that we were seeing back then with satellite imagery. Um, today, we're kind of talking about what are kind of the mundane and repetitive tasks that could be done by a machine uh, to improve the quality of the map and to simplify the process. Of course, for more complicated tasks and kind of in general for, for bringing knowledge into the mapping you're doing, uh, you know, the kind of the human attention and judgment is always something that's required. So kind of the most obvious thing we can do with computers is we have uh, verification and validations, and I showed some of those earlier. Um, and then where we're getting to now is, you know, given the satellite imagery, can we kind of have the computer come up with the roads that are on it or the buildings that are on it um, and propose those as edits? Um, in the future, you know, there might be things that affect uh, navigation and routing. Um, I don't know. And when it comes to suggesting feature, you know, I was suggesting the features, I'm going to show soon how we're thinking about doing the roads and, and, and um, the buildings. Uh, and then kind of um, further future, uh, and there's potential here with um, the auto, like can we do auto alignment even for the satellite imagery where that's still an outstanding problem? And what kinds of data sources can we work with in conflating these? Okay. Right. So we've been experimenting with computer assisted mapping for years. We've had various degrees of success. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback from the community. And here's what we've done to speed up the road mapping. I want to play this for you. We think after working on it with some design iteration here and there, we've kind of come up with a really great way to kind of merge computer uh, assisted mapping and the task you might do as a person. Uh, so let me bring this in. So this is kind of a normal workflow coming in from the tasking manager. Um, you know, select a task. We were jumping into Rapid, our, our editor, and um, zooming in kind of what you might do to draw a line by hand. All right, and you might assign road type or kind of get that going. And, and so now we're going to show what we're doing in Rapid. This is what we've developed um, based on computer, the machine learned roads. They're kind of proposed as edits. The geometry that's drawn, the, the digitization is already, already pretty good. And you can kind of go in there, select them, choose to add them to the map or not. Um, you'll see that roads that are selected might automatically connect with um, ways that are already present in OSM. They're conflict, uh, conflated. And then here we're showing some of that validation earlier, how it's built in. So you add the roads, uh, validate them, and, and it's kind of a, a quicker workflow for working through this. And so this is what we released in July. This is our rapid editor. Um, and it's, it's the basis of this. So we think with this, uh, we've got the right balance here between what the machine can do and uh, what decisions that you might make as the editor. 
Okay, so to get to the, to kind of show what it's doing, so to get to the bottom of it all, it's um, there's, there's kind of a big computer vision model, a neural network that detects roads from high resolution satellite imagery. Um, so these are the roads that we've detected, kind of raw pixel data from the satellite imagery. It's a challenging task, and um, terrain can be different throughout the world. So we have a single global model that works across everywhere. Uh, well, okay, um, I'm gonna skip over for a moment. So uh, let me just bop out in here. Um. It was not on time, but we are actually perfectly on time. Okay. So, um, right, we have a single, single global model that we're using across different terrains. Um, this here is Ethiopia. Uh, in many cases, the model is advanced enough that it can kind of work correctly uh, all over, but you can see there's still some things that don't quite work out. So in the bottom right, there's a dry riverbed that gets picked up as a false positive, and that's, that's a place where, you know, it's still up to you whether you're going to accept or reject the changes that, that have been proposed. All right, and here's Nigeria. It's another interesting case, and, and it has a lot of tree cover. Uh, and you see the model's still quite good at picking out the roads. Okay, and lastly is Boston. So this is my home city, uh, and it turns out that we detect all these streets in Boston, which is great. Uh, but it turns out Boston's already very well mapped, so having all these uh, might be kind of a lot of noisy data. And so what we do next is the last stage of this process. Um, and, and what we do is we're doing conflation. Uh, those are a bit thin, but you can see there's the magenta layer over here that's all the rows that we've detected that are not yet in OSM. So on the right-hand side is the OSM database that this is, uh, on the left-hand side, sorry, and on the right-hand side is after we've done conflation with what's there, um, we brought in, and that's, that's basically how rapid works. It's pretty, you know, doing that, uh, uh, taking the, the raw predictions, turning them into a form that are usable and worth bringing in potentially, um, and then presenting them to you as an editor where you can use that as a basis for, for your work from that point forward. Okay, and so there we got, uh, right, so we released this in July, we got some feedback. Uh, two of the big pieces of feedback, one was countries, um, so we've been adding a lot of countries. Today we just added Zambia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, so those are available. Um, there are many other countries there as well. Um, We've also had a request for a lot of other data sets. So this isn't just a, a machine learning workflow, it's really a data set uh, uh, workflow where the machine learning data is just one of those available ones. And so if you think uh, data sets not yet in OSM and you think you know, um, kind of conflating out with somewhere and you think of, hey, buildings might be a ni nice place to go forward with this, you might think of the Microsoft data set. Uh, and they announced yesterday also that they've expanded the US building footprint. There's now in Tanzania and Uganda, Uganda um, uh, available, another 18 million buildings there. Uh, and so what we'd like to do is show you kind of an experimental feature that we put together using uh, buildings here. Uh, so this is the standard, the standard roads workflow. I'm just gonna go over here, kind of highlighting those. And then here we're getting into what we've got is this new buildings workflow. And this is a, so you can see it kind of behaves the same way. You select what makes sense, reject what doesn't make sense, and you can move along. All right. Yeah, so, so what can you do today? Um, use it, you know, go check it out. See if, you know, if this is something you're interested in. There's mapwith.ai, it's a website you can go check out. You can learn more about this technology and jump into Rapid and, and do some editing. There's a very special link up here for the experimental buildings feature. That's um, mapwith.ai slash rapid dash SOTM 2019. Um, try that to, uh, to, um, to see if buildings, you know, it's available in the US, uh, Tanzania, and Uganda. Um, and also today at three o'clock to four o'clock we'll be talking in Mathematicon B as a birds of the feather session, which is in the green square on the back page of your, your program. Um, if you need to find it, it's a different building. And uh, lastly, you can reach us at Map with AI feedback on the Slack channel. And so that's the, the Map with AI portion. I'm gonna hand it over to Kevin now to talk about um, ingestion of OSM data.
Sorry. Hello? Okay. Um, all right, I don't have a ton of time, so I'll try to get through this material fairly quickly. Um, so what Chris was talking about was kind of the upstream of OSM, getting data into OSM using these various models. What I'm going to talk about is how Facebook deals with OSM data downstream, so how we ingest it and uh, kind of clean it up. So, uh, okay. so restating our vision, our vision is to continuously ingest and integrate changes from upstream OSM while keeping the map fresh and correct. Uh, let's see. Okay. So kind of restating what we talked about last year at State of the Map US, we started this project Mobius. We called it Mobius because OSM is never finished. Uh, and the main outcome of this project has been this graph theoretic construction that we call logical change sets or LOCHAs. Uh, and we use this to demonstrate that we could ingest just the Thailand roads that our uh, mapping team had created without having to deal with uh, ingesting all the rest of OSM and think about, thinking about how to clean up that data. So this is a real challenge because OSM is massive. There are 20 to 30,000 change sets every day uh, with 3 million daily changes. So there's a ton of data. Uh, how do we process this at a regular cadence while maintaining freshness and correctness? So basically, the logical change sets are we take our version of OSM and we take a recent snapshot uh, of OSM that's, that's the latest, and we just take a diff of those two things, right? So we're not continuously ingesting. We, we take a snapshot every few weeks. We take the diff. This gives us a flat list of all of the changes, of all of the features that have changed in, in, you know, since we've last updated. And then we recluster those into a different set of change sets that's kind of orthogonal to the usual notion of an OSM change set. And the point is to maintain geometric integrity. So if in a single change set, someone changed a road over in Thailand and someone changed a road in Germany in the same change set, those should belong in different logical change sets. But then at the same time, if someone creates a road and then later a different person modifies that road, that's kind of the same change set. So we break them up into these clusters. Uh, and then we review them, right? So, and then the nice thing about these clusters is that you can sort of reject an arbitrary number of them, accept an arbitrary number of them, uh, and when you apply just that subset, uh, you still get kind of a, a map that has geometric integrity, right? You don't have dangling references, you don't have roads that just sort of cut off at a tile or something. Um, so that is, in a nutshell, how uh, the loches work. Okay, so I have to skip a few slides talking about the manual review. Uh, the, the crux of this is, is that we need to maximize the number of automatic decisions that we make because human reviewers, it would take just hundreds of human reviewers to actually get through all these logical change sets. So we introduced machine augmented review. Uh, and the basic crux here is that you sort of want some of the machine augmented review to figure out if a change set is good or if a change set is bad. And those are kind of separate procedures. Uh, and let me just talk a little bit about some of the rules that we use to actually decide whether a change set is good or bad. Um, so first we score things per feature, and then if a given cluster has all approved features, we approve that cluster. If the cluster has a rejected feature, then we reject that cluster. Otherwise, we have to manually review it. Uh, and so some of the cool techniques we use are, we use algorithmic curve similarity. So for example, if someone draws a road around a curve and then someone else comes in and kind of modifies it to really make it a little more precise, then, uh, then we, we can automatically accept that. Uh, we use the AI-assisted validation, so some of the automatic road detection stuff that Chris was talking about, we can use to validate other roads. Uh, and we look at tag change significance uh, to determine whether uh, a tag change is significant. So changing something from grass to grassland is maybe not that significant, but changing it to a lake is significant. Um, and finally, we use the age of the edit. So if someone edited something, it hasn't been touched in six months, that tend, leads us to tend to believe that actually that change is probably okay if it hasn't been reverted. Um, and finally, user reputation. Um, the takeaway here is that we were able to approve three million features in 2018. We've 25x that since then. And our goal is to get all 1.8 billion features that are between us and the latest version of OSM. And the mission is finally to catch up and stay caught up at a regular cadence. All right, I think I'm out of time, so uh, I guess that's it. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry to cut you a little bit, but I also want to give the space to the room to ask a few questions because I think there are many questions. I see already several hands. Let's take two questions at the same time. Um, so 
whether we use it, Facebook or not, I think we can probably all agree Facebook are in a really powerful position um, to tell its users that actually the reason your maps are high quality and um, up to date, um, or you know as up to date as they are, is because of OpenStreetMap. Um, so my question is going to be a bit two part. One is because there's going to be lots of people that want to ask you about attribution and calling it um, OpenStreetMap, not Facebook Maps at times. Um, but also I just think, is there anything you're doing to kind of help that perception of help tell your users why your maps are good on a kind of beyond just um, attribution? Can we take a second question just now so we can just answer them all? Hello. Um, you show how quickly it is to map all these areas in Indonesia and some other countries. And what we have to reality is the one from above and the one on the ground. So how much percentage of all those roads maps through Rapid ID are getting a check if they are correct or not? And if they are not correct, are you also feeding the models to be able to correct that in another cities and other places? Lot. Um, so one question from uh, Miriam about uh, the models and checking the data, and one question about Gregory about contribution. And yeah, more OpenStreetMap as a as a finding a place on Facebook. Hmm. Uh, so for attribution, uh, we, we do have an attribution to OpenStreetMap, um, and we're currently working to kind of unify the maps experience. Uh, you know, we have many different services on many different operating systems, um, but attribution is a very important topic to us, so um, we are working to kind of unify that, how, how people see that. Right, for them. This is the mapping. Uh, so how many things on Rapid are actually validated on as ground truth as well? Um, do we have numbers around percentage? So I don't have numbers around percentages of the rows that are there now. Um, find me after, and we could t I could connect you with the right people who would know more about exactly what we've got there. The work that we did in Indonesia that I showed, we're working with HOT, um, HOT in Indonesia, and there's a local team there. So we, you know, tends to roads tend to get validated where there's more uncertainty rather than less uncertainty coming from the satellite mapping. But um, yeah, let's, I can follow up with you more with that if you'd like. Let's take uh, one more question. Hi, uh, thank you for presentation. And I have a question regarding these models. You said you, you are using single model for, for the whole world, for all areas. So the question is why you decided to go with, the, with, with a single model and do you uh, do some, some sort of pre-processing of those images so that you can somehow unify them on, on the, on, on like on machine level and, and something like that. Sure, so the first part is what, uh, why are we using a global model rather than I guess multiple regional models? And I missed the second question. So the, que uh, the, the, the second question, like do you do some sort of pre-processing of those images? Like, I don't know, any, any type of filtering like, I mean, you, you can make them black and white and or, or something like that. I mean, this would be a stupid, I guess, but I mean, any type of, of pre-process. Sure, yeah, there's a good blog post on this. So um, a single model makes sense because it's working, and then we can train a single model that works for the world, and we can kind of improve everywhere as we go working but did on it. did you compare it to, 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 to using multiple models, or, or it was just single shot, shot working from the beginning, and that's it? Oh, like a, yeah, we should follow up on this. I'll connect you with the people who are, you know, working on the specific models themselves. There's also a great blog post on uh, Facebook's AI blog that goes into some of the detail about exactly what the model is doing um, that was published back in July. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, this was it. They are still around. Um, so ask your questions. I think there are many more questions. And also, I think there's more to tell from your side, too. Um, so thanks a lot. Give them an applause. Thank you. <laughs>